Yeah, so hello and welcome back to After Hours. It's been a while, hasn't it? When icebergs first popping up, I didn't really like them a whole lot. To me, they kind of like seem to boil down to the shit that everyone knew and shit that no one knew, with no in-between. There's no progression from one point to the other. But I've seen some lately where there is like a whole progression from like stuff that everyone knows at the top and then it's like slowly but ever so slow surely surely gets more and more obscure you know starting from like silent hill resident evil and then down 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 way down below we have like shit like obscure russian homemade like point and click adventures and like weird turkish stuff from the 2000s so i figured today let's take a look at the survival horror iceberg it it might not fit Yours, mine, or well, anyone's definition of what a survival horror game is, or even horror in some cases, but I do think it's interesting and it does like go over like a lot of obscure stuff that I really really like. So yeah, let's just roll with it, right? Level 0, the sky above. Yeah, Little Zero is obvious, it's the sky above the iceberg, and it consists of games that like literally everyone that has played a video game know about. Silent Hill, which came out in 1999, was Konami's answers to the popularity of Resident Evil. It's a series of mostly third-person survival horror games where the protagonist is drawn to the mysterious town of Silent Hill, and here they will confront a part of themselves that they thought had they had buried so deep that it would never resurface. While it would never quite compete in sales, its critical reception is to my knowledge better than Resident Evil's, at least for the first three entries, and culturally it has a disproportionately large presence compared to Resident Evil. It's a game that hasn't had a new installment in almost 10 fucking years, and we still talk about it to this day. And we talk about it almost as much as we talk about Resident Evil, which has a new installment every year and sells millions and millions of units. Which Speaking of, Resident Evil from 1996 is another series of mostly third-person survival horror games. In the first one you go to look into some disappearances in a forest and you find yourself surrounded by zombies and other creepy crawlies and you end up taking refuge in a mansion, a mansion where you uncover a mystery hidden beneath it and also how a massive biotech corporation fits into all of that. It's often wrongly hailed as the first survival horror game and is also sometimes less often also wrongly hailed as the first game to coin the survival horror game definition. It's not, and the genre and the verbiage has been around since way, way, way long before. The first adventure game with a limited inventory was created back in the 60s by some lady on a mainframe computer, and arguably the first survival horror game was released in 1973, and you can check out that by watching the first episode of my History of Survival Horror documentary series if you want to know more. Amnesia from 2010 is the game that made the hide-and-seek subgenre of horror games incredibly popular thanks to YouTubers playing the games and screaming at them, and millions of people wanting to watch that. It's Frictional Games' fourth game, and I'm sure we'll be talking about their first trilogy a little down the iceberg. Coming out the same year as the horror gaming YouTuber craze, Slender the Eight Pages is a fairly short hide-and-seek game where the protagonist has to find the titular eight pages, meanwhile also dodging the also titular Slenderman who was popularized in internet culture a couple of years before this game came out. It's not a great game, but it made for great entertainment to watch someone else play it, and it would run on pretty much anything. Outlast from 2014 is like if Slender the Eight Pages was good. It marked a change for the genre, suddenly there was money in horror again, and we've gotten quite a lot of good horror games since Outlast because of Outlast and those YouTubers that screamed at it and many games like it. It's an ongoing series of hide and seek games that focuses more on the running than the hiding and it's pretty alright, at least the first one. The same year as Outlast we got Five Nights at Freddy's, a game that quickly turned into four more games due to the very simple game design. In it you are a night watchman who has to keep an eye on a pizzeria at night from a security room. The pizzeria is home to haunted animatronics that come alive at night, and you have to keep an eye on them using the security room's cameras, and then, um, like, do stuff. The creator of the game is a human piece of garbage, and I don't want to talk about his fucking games. Phasmophobia released in early access in September 2020 and became quite popular due to its 4-player cooperative survival horror gameplay, and the streamers and the YouTubers that played it, of course, with their peers. 
I don't really think it's fitting for this tier, as it's not quite a finished game yet, and it really hasn't reached the heights in popularity that most of the other entries on this tier have, and probably never will due to how saturated the genre is, and how fast it moves these days. The Evil Within from 2014 is another title that I don't really think fits here either. It's a game directed by Resident Evil 1, 2 and 4 director Shinji Mikami, and it borrows a lot of its gameplay and general style from that last one, but with a return to the more horror-ish style of his earlier games. It received a somewhat mixed critical and audience reception, and the series has been dormant since the sequel released, which for a different reason also had a similar mixed and critical audience reception. Level 1. The Tip. Now we're getting into something a little meaty. These are the games that you know about if you like and play horror games. The incredibly sad thing about this tier is that I don't think a single one of these have gotten a sequel in almost 10 fucking years. Fatal Frame is a series that started on the PlayStation 2 and could ever really have gotten as far as it did by starting on that console. It's essentially Namco's take on a survival horror game. In each installment you follow a cast of characters as they investigate a haunted house and try and figure out what happened there to make it haunted. What sets this series apart from most other survival horror games is that you do not have a weapon. Armed with only the mystical camera, the camera obscura, you fight ghosts by taking pictures of them and trapping their souls. While it was a hit with critics, it didn't really set the world on fire in the sales department, and it only survived as long as it did by jumping to the Wii, where it could be produced much cheaper due to that console's simpler graphics, and then later on the Wii U, where it performed alright because it was pretty much the only horror game on that platform. The first Fear released in 2005, and the series concluded with the idiotically titled Freer in 2011, the third in the trilogy and the conclusion to the story that started in the first game. It's an odd inclusion on the iceberg because the absolute fucking worst parts of Fear is the horror. <laughs> the story sees you step into the shoes of Point Man. Yes, that's really his fucking name. <laughs> a new recruit of a task force that hunts and stops supernatural phenomena. You and your team is called in to stop an escaped psychic and then things go half-life. Gameplay is absolutely amazing and it's a combination of high-octane Matrix-style action and also very tactical shooting, and there has never quite been anything like it since. The Suffering, released in 2004, is a game about a man named Tork who is a prisoner sent to death row for murdering on his wife. An earthquake happens at the prison he's incarcerated at, and out of the ground scrolls terrible, horrible, creepy crawling monsters. It's a very off-the-era console shooter, meaning that it's a little awkward to control, and it doesn't run terribly smooth, but a neat little thing though is that you have the option of playing in either third or first person, which is pretty nice and, uh, I don't know, very unique. Dead Space from 2008 could probably have switched tiers with the evil within on this iceberg, as it's arguably the most famous and probably the best horror franchise to come out of the 2000s. The game stars Isaac Clarke, who's accompanying an investigation team that's heading to a spaceship that has gone dark. The reason that Isaac is there is that his girlfriend is supposedly on the ship. Shit quickly gets real and spooky monsters assault and slaughter almost all of the investigation team, and it becomes clear that they've laid waste to most of the original crew that was aboard the ship. Gameplay is mostly a standard third-person survival horror game, with the standout feature being the live dismemberment system that enables Isaac to technically cripple his enemies. Directed by Silent Hill director Keiichi Otoyama, 2003's Siren is Sony's attempt to emulate the success and feel of the Silent Hill games. They failed, but it's not for a lack of trying. And the series has a lot of good qualities, but they're unfortunately outweighed by the bad. The first game is impossible to complete without a guide, but the second one is better and I hear the third one is actually pretty alright. If you've played a survival horror game, you kind of know what you're in for, except that it's light on combat and heavy on puzzles, and features a strange character switching mechanic where you play as certain characters at certain points in the game, and need to do very specific things in order for other characters to be able to later on progress through their bits of the story, and if you don't do exactly as the game wants, it will lock up and you cannot progress and you cannot complete it. The Xbox 360 needed a launch window title to show off what the new console could do, and Monolith Productions, they provided. 
2005's Condemned is an investigative first-person horror brawler, and in the first game it sees you step into the shoes of a Crystal Police investigator as he responds to a disturbance and finds himself locked inside an apartment building that's crawling with dudes that wanna kill him. It received a follow-up a few years later and it concluded the story that the first game had started. When you think Japanese Super Nintendo, you don't exactly think horror, but in 1995, during the twilight years of the platform, it got Clock Tower. A point-and-click horror adventure game where you are put in the shoes of a young girl named Jennifer, who has just been adopted by the strange and mysterious man, Mr. Burrows. She arrives at the house and then there is no Burrows. And before long she finds herself stalked by Scissor Man, a hideous little goblin creature that wields a giant pair of scissors. Jennifer can't fight so she has to run and hide from Scissor Man, and when she's not being hunted by him she has to try and figure out what happened to the other girls that were also adopted and maybe also figure out how to escape the mansion. The game would get ported to the PlayStation later on, and here it will also receive two sequels, and one on the PS2 a couple of years later, and also a couple of like vaguely like spiritual successor spin-offs. And then a proper spiritual successor directed by the game's original creator a couple of years after that. 2012's Cry of Fear is the most famous source mod that isn't a source mod, because it's actually a gold source mod, meaning that it wasn't made in Half-Life 2's engine, but in Half-Life 1's engine. It's a first-person investigative horror game with a healthy dose of combat. What sets it apart is that it's available for free, and it's also set in Sweden, unlike a lot of other horror games. It's pretty good, but I actually think that the prequel is better. Released in 2003, Manhunt is more famous for the idiotic moral panic that it caused among parents than it is for anything else. It's a sort of like reverse horror game where you're trapped within a murder gauntlet competition, and you have to murder the psychopath sent in to murder you. It visually looks like a GTA game, and that was because it was made in a modified version of GTA 3's engine, I believe. And it plays a bit like Hitman, except that the enemies are aware that you are around and that you are stalking them. 2010's Deadly Premonition is often incorrectly referred to as the king of so bad it's good video games. Released on the Xbox 360, it does have incredibly dated visuals, and it was made by a very inexperienced team, and it was stuck in development hell for quite a while, as the team failed to make the game run smoothly for the longest time, and it was also briefly cancelled due to the producers of Twin Peaks, thinking that it was a little too close to that series. If you can look past its scuffed presentation, you are in for an amazing cheerjerker of a game that will make you both cry and laugh, and sometimes at the same time. You play as FBI Special Agent Francis York Morgan as he arrives in the sleepy town of Greenvale following the murder of a teenage girl, and then you begin investigating what happened and how it all relates to other murders that you've been investigating around the country. Alone in the Dark from 1992 is the original classic survival horror game. It has fixed camera angles, limited inventory, and terrible graphics. It will go on to spawn quite a few sequels, including two soft reboots, and while the last soft reboot was commercially successful, its critical reception was understandably middling. And its very late 2000s design was, has not like aged terribly well. There has been an attempt to revive the series proper with a light on story objective based co-op game, but it was panned harder than any of the other reboots and it also sold poorly. Level 2. Below the surface. We're now submerged. We're now beneath the water. We were looking at a couple of lesser known prequels, spiritual successes, cult favorites, and of course, some weird fucking Japanese shit. Cold Fear from 2005 is a third person survival horror game in the vein of Resident Evil 4. It stars a man who's a part of a Coast Guard rescue team that receives a distress call from a Russian freighter, which they go to investigate, and then things of course get fucking weird and a little zombie ish. It takes place largely on one ship or another and there are some absolutely epic weather effects at display here that wow you a lot when you first play it. 1989 Sweet Home is sometimes wrongly referred to as the game that inspired Resident Evil. It did not. Capcom asked Shinji Mikami to make a sequel or a remake of it, and he had just played Alone in the Dark and wanted to make something like that instead, and so he did that. Released on the NES, the game is not terribly spooky, but not from a lack of trying. It's a top-down RPG that sees you control a team of five paranormal investigators as they try and figure out what happened to a mysterious weird family. There is a heavy emphasis on puzzle solving. Each team member has different abilities and there are different items that you need to pick up to progress, 
like a wooden board that you can use to create a bridge, a rope, etc. Combat is turn-based and as you're walking through the mansion you'll be assaulted by the monsters that lurk around here in sort of like a random encounter like Dragon Quest style. It was made as a tie-in to a made-for-TV movie of the same name and the movie is a better experience than the game. It's not bad, it's just like an NES RPG from like 1989 that's about like three hours too long. Call of Cthulhu Dark Corners of the Earth from 2005 is a first-person survival horror game based on an HP Lovecraft story. In the game you arrive in a mysterious town full of mysterious people and you start investigating something and then the townspeople get mad at you and begin to try and murder you. Silent Hill the Arcade is an arcade light gun shooter that was developed with some involvement from the original members of Team Silent and it was released in 2007 in Japan and elsewhere in 2008. The story is that a team of paranormal nerds go to Silent Hill to check out the rumors and go check in at a motel for the night. One of them has a terrible nightmare then when he wakes up his friends are missing and he has to gun his way through the town to find them. Before Frictional made it big with Amnesia, they developed and released the Pindom trilogy, starting with the first game in 2007. The story is that Philip, a physicist, receives a mysterious letter from his dead father that begins him to come to a research facility in Northern Greenland. And here, shit goes down. If you've played Amnesia, then you know what you're in for with the gameplay. Lots of looking through drawers, manipulating physics, and unlike Amnesia, also engaging in dog shit combat. <laughs> Hell Knight was originally released in 1998 in Japan and in 1999 in Europe on the last fiscal day of the year for what I assume are borderline tax evasion reasons. Like seriously, I'm pretty sure they released this on that exact day so that they could write off its costs as a loss and then stay in a lower tax bracket in Europe. And it's a shame, because Hell Knight is a brilliant first-person exploration horror game that opens up as you, the protagonist, is on a metro train that mysteriously crashes, and then you find yourself in a pseudo-society that exists beneath the streets of Tokyo in Old World War II doomsday bunkers, which is a common spooky setting in Japanese media that we're not terribly aware of in the West. And it has some truth to it, as there are urban legends, rumors, and somewhat like credible reports of Japanese soldiers being down in those bunkers and torments for quite some time following the war, or just like awaiting orders for what to do next. Orders which didn't come because after the war, Japan was like very busy burning all of the files and traces of their military installations following the war so that they couldn't be held accountable for the millions of Chinese people they exterminated. Alien vs Predator can refer to a few different things, but I'm guessing it's either the 1994 first person shooter for the Atari Jaguar, or the 1999 PC update and its sequel, or the 2010 reboot. The 1999 game is the one that I'm the most familiar with, and in that you can play through three different single player campaigns, Alien, Predator or Marine. Each follows a different story and plays very differently because the creatures you'll be playing as are very different. The game is most remembered for its multiplayer mode, in which players pick one of three teams and then went toe to toe to toe against each other. It was so popular that it eventually was supplanted by a Half-Life 1 mod, featuring the same concept called Natural Selection, one of many mods that were essentially Left 4 Dead before Left 4 Dead was actually a thing. Cryostasis is a Russian game from 2008. You play as a Russian weather researcher named Alex, who in 1981 after having completed a tour of the research station at the North Pole, attempts to hitch a ride on a ship and go back to Russia. Things don't go quite according to plan, and Alex finds himself trapped on the ship, which has apparently been missing since the 60s, and he must battle the craft's passengers aboard and attempt to rewrite history by entering the memories of those passengers and then changing their actions in the past so that the future might change. It's a beautifully told, presented, and paced game and it's very tense as you're creeping your way through the hallways, always keeping an eye out for where there might be some ammo and an ear out for where there might be an enemy. I think it's one of the most underrated games of the 2000s, and it's a shame that we haven't seen a modern re-release of it yet. Obscure is a 2004 co-op survival horror game about a group of teenagers who come to their school at night to try and figure out what happened to their missing friend. They discover that the faculty of the school has been abducting and experimenting on students in order to give themselves immortality, and that some of them are over 100 years old, despite looking like they are about like the same age as their parent. It's very campy, and the story plays out like a mix between the Elijah Wood movie The Faculty and an episode of Buffy the Vampire Slayer. 
Nightmare Creatures is a 1997 game that I don't think should be on here. And if it should be on here, then there are a lot of other games that should be as well. The story is that you play as one of two characters and that you have to stop a cult from taking over the world by turning people into grotesque monsters and that they can use as soldiers in their infernal army. It's not really framed as a horror game plot-wise, it just takes place in a dark and twisted gothic world. And if that makes a horror game, then Castlevania and Bloodborne as well as like hundreds of other games should also be considered horror games and also be on this iceberg. But I suppose that you could argue that the setting doesn't make a horror game, but that the gameplay does. And well, Nightmare Creatures isn't really a horror game in that respect either. It's a beat em up and it even has an adrenaline meter that will make you lose health if you go too long in between killing monsters. D aka D's Diner aka D's Dinner aka D's Dinner Table from 1995 stars Laura Harris who gets a call that her father has gone on a shooting spree and then she goes to the hospital where he has barricaded himself in order to find out what happened. Horrified by what she sees at the scene of the crime, she covers her eyes and but when she opens them again, she is in a medieval castle. Gameplay can best be described as an interactive movie, as it plays out a bit like a first person adventure game, but really light on actual puzzle solving. Director Kenji Eno is arguably more famous than the game itself and he became an industry legend when he purposefully submitted the game late for approval and was scolded and told that he had to deliver the final build to the manufacturer himself as a punishment. But here's the thing, he had submitted the game late for this exact purpose, because he knew that he would be forced to then go hand deliver it himself. He had actually submitted a less gory and less violent version for approval, and when delivering his game to the manufacturer, he delivered them the gorier version which was then printed and distributed. Before Team Siskala made Cry of Fear, they in 2007 made Afraid of Monsters of which Cry of Fear is kind of like a remake of. It follows a lot of the same story beats and some of the locations and monsters designs are shared between the two. It in many many ways feels like a prototype for what Cry of Fear would eventually become. The story in Afraid of Monsters is a lot more simplistic and there is a greater emphasis on combat, scares, platforming and exploration and I actually think that it's a greater game for it. I think Doing the more simple thing means that there's less of a chance that you're gonna end up being like a little bit of a cringy, edgy emo boy that's like, I don't know, that's just me. Rule of Rose from 2006 is a classic survival horror game with most of the trappings that you know from that genre. It takes place in the 1930s and stars Jennifer, again, a young woman who befriends a boy while on a bus ride. The boy gives her a book and then he gets off the bus and runs off. And for whatever reason, Jennifer follows him and arrives at an orphanage that seems a little familiar to her. It's a story about confronting the past, and if you told me that it was a clock tower game, I would have believed you, mostly because it was supposed to be one. The Wii was a bit of a godsend for budget developers. It was essentially the PS2 2, and a lot of what had worked on the PS2 also worked on the Wii. And sometimes it didn't because the developer decided to include motion controls. And Cursed Mountain from 2009 is one of the like latter ones. It's got a great premise. It takes place in the 1980s in the Himalayan mountains and it stars Eric Simmons, an experienced mountain climber who sets out to track down his brother whom went missing in the region. He finds himself in a village that's completely deserted and after being assaulted and fighting off evil spirits, he is then taught how to open his third eye so that he can rid the titular cursed mountain of evil and find out what happened to his brother. The plot is great and I really like enjoy the exploration bits, but the motion control combat is such a slug unfortunately and the game is like way too fucking long for its own good. Released in its various incarnations between 2003 and 2004, Curse the Eye of Isis is a comic justice tale about a British archaeologist who finds himself besieged by terrible monsters as a group of thieves break into the museum he works at and accidentally unleash a curse while trying to steal a mummy. Gameplay can best be described as a pretty standard survival horror affair, which will be something that we'll be saying more and more from here on out, as it's a fair description of gameplay for a lot of these games on the lower tiers. Level 3. Halfway down. The light from buff is dim, and that fittingly reflects the lack of spotlights that these games got when they first came out, which doomed them to a faith of obscurity. I'll also be googling a few things from here on out as we're moving into things that are so obscure 
that I don't have first-hand knowledge with each and every one of them. And for transparency's sake, I will be putting an on-screen disclaimer for the ones that are new to me. URMT is a horror shooter developed in Ukraine and released in 2006. It's a little infamous for its secret localization that cast, I assume, like the localizes American teenage children as its Soviet-era grizzled male characters, which does pull you out of the experience a little bit. It takes place in the 50s as a Soviet man is hit by a car and then wakes up sometimes later in a hospital and finds himself under the attack from big titty zombie nurses and other morphed monsters. It reminds me a lot of Cry of Fear and I wouldn't be surprised if Team Siskala were a little inspired by this, like they were with many other games on the iceberg. It's available for free on various abandoned websites and you can check my website for a download, link is in the description. White Day can either refer to the original 2001 game or the 2015 remake. In the original, a school built during the Korean War was cursed because its Feng Shui was out of balance. And yes, Feng Shui is an architectural and interior decorating school of thought, but they take it a lot more serious in Korea. This imbalance caused the school to be haunted and five medallions were created to bring back balance. Unfortunately, this had the effect of trapping everyone that dies inside the school in limbo forever keeping them from entering the afterlife. About 50 years later, a lady pleads with a mysterious man to bring back her daughter to life who killed herself at the school and then get her out. He agrees and performs a ritual with some students at the school, but the ritual goes wrong, partially because a spirit trapped within known as the Master of the Labyrinth sabotages the ritual. And in the game, you play as one of the students trying to escape in this first-person survival horror game. Two years before Resident Evil in 1994, Another Japanese software house took a crack at replicating the Alone in the Dark formula and they developed Dr. Hauser, a clone of that game for the 3DO. There is not a whole lot to say about it, it's a clone of Alone in the Dark made by River Hill Soft, a software house that will go on to make quite a lot of clones for more popular games, including a clone of Resident Evil called Overblood and a mashup of Ocarina of Time and Resident Evil 7 called Overblood 2. Terra Track's Track of the Vampire is a 1995 FMV game that was released for the PC and the Mac, with a rumored Apple Bandai Pippin release which has never been confirmed to be real. In the game, you are the commander of a nationwide organization of supernatural hunters, and you will be commanding your men from the control room as they respond to various disturbances around the country. How this works is that the agents are wearing a pair of camera enabled goggles, and they will enter and investigate the various scenes, and when something happens, button prompts will appear on the screen, and those will be the commands that you can issue them. I mean, it's, it's kind of neat, but the game is like all around fairly forgettable, and of the thousands of FMV games from the 90s, it's only remembered because it was also supposed to appear on a strange console that was made by a company that would later go on to become one of the biggest tech giants in the world. Garage Bad Dream Adventure is a 1995 point and click adventure game conceptualized by Japanese surrealist Tomomi Yumi Sakuba. It takes place in a disgusting biomechanical future, where you play as a tiny robot that tries to escape the world that it lives in. The game's place on this level of the iceberg is due to its rarity. It was published and manufactured by Toshiba as they were shutting down production of their CD printing factory, and as a result only 3000 copies were produced. The director Sakuba refused to produce more copies as he felt the game would be outdated to new audiences, and also explained that he didn't have the right to do so even if he wanted to. However, a copy of the game went up for auction a few years ago and 4chan users pulled together the funds to buy it and dumped it on the internet. It's unknown how much money they paid, but rumor has it that it was quite a lot. The Dark Eye is a 1995 surreal first-person point-and-click adventure game in the same vein as Myst, but with no puzzle to speak of and a great emphasis on story. You as the protagonist arrives in classic Poe fashion at a mysterious mansion, and here things quickly go from bad to even worse. The game's story alternates between what happens in the real world and what happens in the protagonist's pink thinner induced fever dreams, where recitals of Edgar Allan Poe's short stories are played out. Last Rites is a 1997 Doom clone in which it's literally hell on earth, and you're a military commander of some sort who has to go on rescue missions to save whoever is left alive. Only thing of note with this game is that it features friendly NPCs that will help you murder the hordes of demons and zombies and other infernal creatures standing in your way. 2003's Hungry Ghost is a Japan-only survival horror game where you play as an unnamed protagonist who arrives in the underworld. You're some kind of warrior and many people have died by your hand and you will certainly be going to hell. 
but a mysterious man offers you a possible way out. Nearby, there is a village full of damned souls that cannot move on to either of the afterlives. And if you can figure out why, the gods may judge you more favorably and you may be reborn as a human and get to try and live a better life the next time around. Gameplay is your classic mega clunky first person PS2 game. The game doesn't utilize dual analog controls despite those having been mainstreamed by this point for years and it uses a weird interaction system where you need to press multiple buttons to do an action because like of course you fucking do. And it's almost worth it because the game is fucking gorgeous in like the way that a hellish nightmare landscape can be gorgeous. It's unfortunately only available in Japanese with no available fan translation. The fourth wall I think refers to a freeware horror game made in 2012 which was available for the PC and I think also the Xbox 360's like live in the marketplace which has now been defunct for years. Due to the terrible name of the game any mentions of it get quickly buried in the search results but I did find the website where it's playable and on YouTube Markiplier apparently did a let's play of it. Nocturne and Blair Witch Volume 1 through 3 should probably be grouped together because Blair Witch Volume 1 is a sequel to the 1999 survival horror game Nocturne set in the 1920s and 30s. Nocturne is about a group of agents working for the Spook House Task Force and we follow them as they investigate and exterminate one supernatural threat after another. The developer then after making that game got the license to make a Blair Witch game and an event from Blair Witch Law just so happened to line up with the time that Nocturne was set in so in Blair Witch Volume 1 the protagonist of that game is a supporting character from Nocturne who then goes on to investigate the original murders that form the origin of the Blair Witch myth and the reason that is not the protagonist of Nocturne himself doing it is that he thinks that ghosts are lame and doesn't believe in them. Yeah, that's real and like the whole thing is real and it gets even crazier because the developer would then go on to make Blood Rain which takes place in the same universe as Nocturne which means that Blair Witch is a prequel to Blood Rain a game where you are a sexy pick titty goth vampire slaying Nazis and also Dale Cooper makes a cameo in Blair Witch somehow Gameplay in Nocturne is a very combat oriented Resident Evil and the sequel dials down the combat a little bit and focuses more on the story and the investigation parts. Barrow Hill Curse of the Ancient Circle from 2006 is a point and click adventure game in the same vein as Myst. Like Myst, it consists of static pre rendered backgrounds and you click your way through them and look for clues and interact with objects. The story is that you investigate why a seemingly normal archaeological dig site has gone wrong and why it's upsetting the local community so much. Nosferatu Wrath of Malachi is a 2003 first person action horror game where the protagonist travels to a castle in Transylvania to attend his sister's wedding but when he arrives the castle is crawling with monsters and he finds himself trying to escape and also trying to rescue the other attendants that are still alive and you know also naturally like find his sister. Level 4 The Lightless Depths we're now firmly in the realm of Abaddonia, the gravesite of the failed games of yesteryear and odd games from the land to the east. The European East first and foremost, but also the Far East. Bureau 13 is a 1995 point and click adventure game based on a tabletop RPG of the same name. The plot sees you play as one of two agents with different skills, journey to a cyberpunk city in order to eliminate one of their own agents that has gone rogue and remove all traces of their investigation's involvement. It's abandonware and it's free on the web. 1998's Iru is a Japan-only first-person hide-and-seek horror game. In it, you play as a school student who, along with other people in his class, are staying after school to finish preparations for an upcoming festival. Something goes wrong and your schoolmate starts showing up dead and it's up to you to find out why and also hide from whoever is trying to kill everyone. This Themia 6 is a serious sand mod that was developed somewhere in between 2003 and 2011 depending on who you ask. It's hard to find anything about it but it was apparently made by a Russian modder and it has both a cult fan base and also a cult hate base for whatever reason. It's available out there for free but fair warning it has a lot of jump scares and some cryptic design choices. The Hunt aka Trick Bloodlines aka Cherny Metka from 2008 is a fully localized Russian made Condemned clone. The strong similarities to Condemned is probably the reason why it was never released in the West officially 
because when I say that it's a contempt clone, I mean that it was made in the same engine, and I don't think it was officially licensed. You play as a man named Nikolai, who is wrongly translated to Nicholas in the English dub, and you've been infected with the mark. The mark is a virus that marks you for death in an underground illegal web show where psychotic killers hunt and stalk you manhunt style. You are contacted by a mysterious man who you then team up with. He will bet on the competition and make some money, and in return he will also help you find the anti-mark group that can remove the virus from your system, making you untraceable to these psycho killers. Gameplay consists of a lot of running, hiding, solving basic puzzles, and also, you know, fighting the psycho killers. The Fear is a 2001 interactive movie game for the PS2. The PS2 is not very well known for its FMV games, but it did receive a handful, and this is one of the better ones. The story is that you are a cameraman who's part of a film crew shooting a horror movie at a haunted mansion, but then the horrors become real and you have to escape by solving puzzles and doing other stuff. It's got some great FMV sequences and I don't know quite how they did it, but there are sections where you are able to move the camera freely and it's really neat. I think they might have filmed some sequences with a 360 degree camera, which explains why you can't move the camera up and down, but you can pan it from side to side, which is really fucking impressive for 2001. The Path is a 2008 experimental art game. It's a contemporary adaptation of The Little Red Riding Hood and in it you guide six sisters to grandmother's house. On the path between their apartment and grandmother's house there are objects of the path that you can choose to let the sisters go fetch or not. The wolf is also present and means something different to each of the sisters. Every little action the player does or does not take has a lot of influence on the ending of the game. But you're not supposed to think of the ending as an ending and each time you get to the end, the game just starts over. Ghost Temple is a 2001 Chinese-only RPG with fixed camera angles a la Resident Evil. The story is that you are a young warrior and you go to battle a thousand-year-old demon, you'll need to feed his army of generals first. It's hard to get any substantial info about it and the only description I can find are in this like unintentionally funny English. Like, let me just read it out to you. While leading our hero, we must use the power of our muscles, white weapons and magic to oppose the numerous servants of evil and ultimately defeat the powerful enemy. So there seems to be multiple playable characters in this game and it seems to be inspired a little or a lot by Yamarasha, a 1998 Chinese only title made by a Taiwanese developer. Erevos is a 2001 point and click game in the same vein as Myst. It's very graphic and comes with a user disclaimer. In the game you play as either a martial arts master or as an escaped mental patient. Unique to this game is that it seems to be divided into levels, unlike the usual like open-ended nature of these kinds of games. Glass Rose is a 2001 point and click adventure game for the PS2. It should be a lot higher on this list because it's fairly well known, it's just not very liked because it's a little boring. In the game you play as a journalist exploring an abandoned mansion with his friend, you are then knocked out and then you wake up 70 years in the past and the mansion is now in its full glory and fully inhabited by various characters. The objective of the game is to figure out how to get back to your own time and to aid you you have the ability to glimpse into people's minds and reveal their hidden thoughts and actions, something that will of course help you in figuring out what happened. Ghost Hunter series Kuro Kishi no Kamen from 1994 it's a first person point and click adventure game in the vein of, you fucking guessed it, Mist, with a sprinkle of black and white FMV sequences to keep things fresh. It's entirely in Japanese and it's very text heavy, but I think it's about a group of ghost hunters going to hunt ghosts, maybe. Based on the title. Robert D. Anderson and the Legacy of Cthulhu was a 2007 multimedia project. It tells the story of a hardball detective from New York who is secretly German and he travels to Germany during the Nazi regime to solve a mystery involving his family at a secluded castle. The multimedia project refers to how the game is both a movie and a game. Most of the exposition is told through filmed live action sequences and in between you gun down Nazis in sort of like a Doom clone style game. Carpus 22 slash Fearstone Strafka 22 is a 2006 fixed camera action horror game from Turkey. It takes place in a near alternate future where an evil Christian cult is slowly taking over the world and you play as a member of the resistance and must shoot your way through all of the baddies and stop the evil cult. 
It's basically Turkish Resident Evil. 2000's Rekuku Kisuku Ikara's Physics Laboratory is a first-person exploration horror game about a paranormal investigator entering a spooky mansion to look for clues as to why it is a spooky mansion. And while also trying to, f you know, not die from being scared to death by these spooky monsters. It looks pretty good, but it was only released in Japan in Japanese and hasn't been translated yet. Yaku Yuju Danki is a 1996 choose your own adventure horror game released exclusively in Japan. You play as two characters who enter a spooky mansion to investigate and find out why it's spooky. They split up at one point and you play as one or the other. And then the choices and the accents you take as one character has influence on what you'll play through as the other characters. In Resident Evil 2 style, you will need to complete the game as one character and then play through it as another character to get the true ending. Day of the Zombie is a 2009 FPS zombie shooter game. It was allegedly made by a studio that got their hands on the master files for the game Land of the Dead Road to Fiddler's Green from 2005 and they made 14 new levels for the game and called it Day of the Zombie and sold it as an original Do Not Steal project. I don't know if any of that is true, but it does kind of look a little familiar to Road to Fiddler's Green. The story is pretty basic. You are a university student and then a zombie outbreak happens at your school and you start to shoot your way through Horse of the Undead and also armed soldiers sent in to stop the outbreak while you also search for your girlfriend. Level 5. The Endless Abyss. We're now at the bottom. The Endless Bottom. Down here where the games that never saw the light of day lurk about. Kinda. I don't know why any of these games are more obscure than the games on level 4, but who am I to question whoever made this survival horror iceberg? In general, they did a pretty good job and I'm just a big fucking nerd. Executioner The Sinister Horror is a 2001 Lost Media point and click horror adventure game or it would be Lost Media if I didn't download 20 different viruses to uncover the last download on the web. I don't know a ton about it because it's made for Windows 98 and while I can get it to boot, I can't get very far as it was originally in Russian and Russian text doesn't really seem to play very nicely with my English language Windows 10 install. I have downloaded a Russian typeset and I'm gonna try it again at some point, but if you want to take a crack at it yourself, I have left a link to my website where it's hosted. IGED is a 2007 freeware point and click horror game that is borderline lost media. It's only available if you DM the creator of this iceberg and ask about it and get a link to the site where it's hosted, because that site is so old and crusty and badly optimized that it's not showing up in the search results. Gerchen Ötzend is a point and click FMV game from 1997 or 1998 depending on who you ask. It was developed in Turkey and premiered at a trade show and then never resurfaced until it was uploaded to archive.org after becoming abandonware. Bloody Aria is a 1997 Korean developed PC Resident Evil clone about a knight arriving at a castle in Romania where he battles a lot of monsters. It's a more action-oriented take on Resident Evil, and I guess since it takes place in medieval night times, it doesn't have a lot of guns either, so I suppose it's also more melee-based and maybe even a beat-em-up? So, that was the big survival horror iceberg. Actually, it was not that big, it took like an hour to get through. That's impressive. Like I mentioned in the beginning, not all of these fit yours, mine, my mother's, your friends, or well, anyone's definition of what a survival horror game is. Or, as we saw with Nightmare Creatures, not even like my definition of what a horror game is. Yes. Anyways, it was very fun to look at. It was basically like a one-man trivia night where I was like going through the list and I was like, yeah, I recognize that, yeah, I recognize that, yeah, I recognize that. Ooh, I have to look into that, I don't know what that is. And do -do 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 very fun to look into and I hope you enjoyed it as well and I hope you you know of course saw some games that you're gonna check out or that you maybe hope that I'm gonna check out and do like a little history thing about because you know who the fuck knows I might and I've of course like also got to like save a few games that are uh, were like borderline or maybe like actual fucking like lost media and that's always also nice <laughs> And yeah, I know it doesn't include every survival horror game there is out there. And I don't know, maybe it fucking shouldn't, right? Because like maybe it should just have like a few genre words. Like it should have like the 
survival horror is born label and then you could just like go over all of like the resident evil ps1 clones and then it could have like the pc is released and then it could have like all the pc clones you know it could have like a few genre labels for when those genres became popularized and that would have maybe been fun to check out but in general a pretty fucking good iceberg and i hope you enjoyed the breakdown of this fucking iceberg yeah, and I, I, I don't know, fucking think that's it for me. Uh, until I see you again, from all of us here at Horrified at the World, take care and good night.